start singing in the spirit. Sing to the Lord a new song. A song on your heart. Christian songs that come on my radio, <laughs> and uh, well, it's not radio. It's 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 this subscription thing that I have, and it's just random. 
that song came out. I said, man, I've never heard that song. That's nice. It's a, it's a nice worship song, and it's, it's, it's a love song is what it is. It's a love song. I said, wow, that's, that's just a nice song.
I, I feel right now the Spirit's wanting to do something. He's wanting to move. They're, they, it's, the heaviness of the Spirit is in here. So let's all raise our hands right now. Just raise them up. Take it in. The Lord who's come against the barriers, the walls to prevent your Spirit from soaking in. Lord, show us your amazing Spirit. Continue to press in. Press us into who you are, of your heart, of your love. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the lifting of the heaviness of the burdens. I just pray a blessing of peace, of prosperity, of, of joy over everyone that's here and hearing this message. Lord, I just pray that your spirit will intervene in anything that's hindering us from connecting with you. Just, Lord, break in, break through, break up that that is preventing us. Thank you, Lord, for holding us in your everlasting love. The peace, the joy, the help. Lord. All we do is call your name, Lord, and you're there. Thank you for the victories, Lord. Thank you for the trials, Lord, that help us grow. Jesus, oh, flow, Holy Let the Spirit. tears flow joy. If God is pressing on you and releasing you, let the tears flow. That's a release, Lord. It's not weakness, it's strength. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Brother. I couldn't tell my eyes are not watering or I mean, it's just I can just feel that presence in life. Now it's just it's, it brought me joy. Surrender. It was it was helpful because it's a release. I, I I'm not one that cries a lot. He but is what I tell you, when you're in you spirit, free. you can't help. You can't no help. Kick against. I just stomach. love that feeling. It's just so great. Receive Thank the you, power Lord. of God. Hallelujah. Power to transform Jesus. and change. Power to mold and to heal. Yes. Power to lift yes. up and to break down. I'm reminded of the scripture Thank you, Lord. that talks about where Thank you, Lord. Jesus was before the people. And it says that the presence of the Lord was, was his, his presence was there in a way that would be that would heal the people. So there are there are different times when God moves. I mean, God's everywhere, but there are different times when it, there's an openness. When he actually moves in and starts, starts working in ways that are beyond what we have normally been accustomed to. Ron will be continuing his uh, series, Made for Mission. Today, he'll be asking the question, why am I on mission? And so let's prepare our hearts to uh, hear Ron's thoughts on, on uh, the answer to that. It's a rather simple message today, but I think most of them are pretty simple. What now? Yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at, you know. I understand that. I understand, I understand the concepts, you know. And uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're involved in anything, whether, whether any discipline, whether it's writing, or whether it's sports, or whether it's music, the people, the people that, that are very, very good, very good at whatever, whatever they, do. they do practice the fundamentals. Meaning, Meaning that, that the musicians, musicians that are, that are very, 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 very good continue to practice their scales and their chords. And, their and, chords. and, and they, 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 they do them in different ways. But you always go back to the fundamentals. You never outgrow. Like a fundamental understanding of life is, who am I? And, and we're going to get into that today. 
because this, this has a lot to do with being a light into this world. It has to do with who we are. Jesus said to those early Christians in Acts chapter 1, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he says, you will be witnesses. You don't go witnessing. This is who you are. This is who you will come, you become. You will just be a witness. When God starts moving in your life, all of a sudden, your agenda changes. You're going to be a witness. This is what you're going to be. So, you know, when we think of witnessing or sharing our faith or talking to people about Jesus, it's not putting on something that we're not. It flows out of who we are. That's why it was very easy for Jesus because he knew who he was. He knew who he was. The temptation account, Satan tried to attack his identity. If you are the son of God, then do this. Do you ever have anybody say, if you really love me, then you will... <laughs> and they want to define you. The world wants to define you. The devil wants to define you. Your flesh wants to define you. Everything on the outside. God, Christ has already made you. Our identity is in Him. And then it just flows. We're trying, if we're to, trying do to do something, something that, we're, that not, we're not, then you need to, you get, need to get real about who we are. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. So, the, uh, this passage that we've looked at different times, go ahead and that, brother. Jesus went through all the towns and the villages. Let's say, let's say this together. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So, why do we, why do we do what we do? This is the same thing that people are today as they were back then. Harassed, Harassed helpless, helpless, like sheep, like sheep without, without a shepherd. If we don't know Jesus, we're battling. We're harassed. It doesn't sound very manly. And it doesn't sound like a person that's in control that would say that they're helpless. I don't know anybody who really came to Jesus that said they're fully in control. <laughs> Normally when we come to Jesus, we're in touch with that helplessness part. That's what opens us up because we're at the end of ourself. We always need to remember, who am I without Jesus? This is it. Harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. I'm just a little sheepy out there. And we know sheep, they go astray. They follow different things. You can't drive sheep, but sheep will follow. That's just what they do. They get off track. As Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone to his own way. <laughs> your way not, may not be my way. And my way not, may not be your way, but it's the wrong way. There's only one way. Jesus says, I am the way. Amen? Amen? I am the way. There's only one way. So, harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. 
If we don't see ourselves like this without Jesus, we're not connected to Jesus. Uh, we're, you know, we've come to Him for something else. Uh, we're, we're doing something else with Jesus then. Isn't that right? I mean, if that's not how we see ourselves without Jesus, that's the first step. So one person says, there's always, in order to get the good news, you've got to have the bad news first. If you get the bad news first, then the good news is great. Great news. <laughs> then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Another reason that we are on mission is because this is who God has called us to. When, he, when we encounter Jesus out of our... And we come to Him because we're harassed and helpless like the sheep without a shepherd. And we come to Him and we find the shepherd of our heart. And we find someone that can heal our broken hearts. Our life changes. And part of the joy is sharing with others this magnificent story of redemption. That's part of it. And God is looking for people. So as we go into Him and grow into Him, we find freedom and then we minister wholeness. That is our vision. We find freedom and we minister wholeness. Some of us are stuck because it's all about us. We come to church all about us. And we're about Jesus all about us. And we're stuck in that all about us place. Find the freedom you need. It's here. Jesus is here. Amen. Our God is he is, he here. is here. Oh. We've we got to find him. him. Though he's, Though he's not, far, not from far from any one of us. And then as he ministers to us, he can minister through us. Next, brother. Have you ever wondered why God has called us to share our faith? Why does he ask us to step out of our comfort zone? It should be our comfort zone. If you take some time, look around. The why is everywhere. Isn't it? The why is everywhere. We got a clip. It gets us into our message. I think, Kathy, as I, you know, I didn't ask, I don't think it's, it, I didn't ask permission, but I want to talk a little bit about how you came to faith. I mean, you know, if Randy Goff hadn't been there, because I know he talked with Mike, and because you guys were floundering. I mean, it was, whether you're going to be married or not, didn't know Jesus, and you guys were open. You didn't know what you were getting into. But you were ready. 
You are ready for something. And there are scads of people around here that are just like you and I. If nobody had entered into our life and talked with us, where would we be? Where would we be? God, get this down inside of us. People need to know you. I was reading some statistics about those that, because of the, of the pandemic, the openness to spiritual things has increased. Among those that don't know Jesus, among those that say they do know Jesus. The spiritual level has increased in this country. It's incre- it, This is a ripe time. This is a real time. Now the statistics will bear it, and, and they saw it, because they, then they gave, they gave percentages. And it's interesting. Whites are at the bottom of the list. Those who are white Anglo-Saxon they are. are at the bottom of the list in seek, uh, because it, it, they they, they, it has increased, but, it, but the Hispanics and the black and those that are African American, it has increased. It's like 50%, 50 of those, 50 to 60% of all those have increased. It's an it's interesting demographics. I was reading it yesterday. There's a hunger. God, make this world hungry for you. Amen. And it gave a this it has a 12-page document of all the scriptures in the Bible that talk about pestilence and plague and all sorts of different things. It has 12 pages of them, of all the places in the Bible where it talked about it. Jesus talked about it, that there will be pestilences. He said that. And the priests were given certain instructions of those that had it said an infection. It was, that's kind of an interesting one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That if they looked a certain way, they should, they, they should isolate for seven days and then come back and see where they're at. And then if not, they go back another seven days. If not, then, the, then they have... And it, it gave different types of understandings that they had to isolate. It was very, it's a very interesting study. What did Solomon say? There's nothing new under the sun, but we think it's new. <laughs> this is not new. All we have to do is just, just get into the history. This has been going around. But people are open. People are open. <laughs> how, do, how do you like... How do you like this quote? The two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. Oh. Lots of people are still searching for that second one. Do you know why you're born? Who defines you? What has defined you? It's all going back down to identity again, isn't it? 
What is your identity? Who defines you? Who are you? You and I were meant, not meant to meander around with no purpose. Amen. We were sent by God into the world just like Jesus was sent into the world. The Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. He came as an extension of the Father to bring hope and healing, salvation. He came to save, He came to seek and to save the lost. It's clear who Jesus was. Serving was the mission of Jesus. This was his identity and is his identity. But that is our identity. If you've been saved by Jesus, you have been sent by Jesus. If you've been saved by Jesus, you have been sent by Jesus. Whatever he, want, whatever he does in you, he wants to do through you. Therefore, we are called to be a river. But many Christians are reservoirs. That they, it, it all comes to me and stays here. And then we become stagnant because the water doesn't flow. We are called to be a river. The way we live dramatically changes when we realize that the God of the universe has set us on a life mission. Our environment will change when we embrace our identity as being sent by God. Our environment will change. You believe that? The way you see everybody, the way you see everything, all of a sudden there's no accidents anymore. There's no happenstance. Sent where? Sent into the people, people's lives who are currently in our life. That's who we're sent to. You and I were made for mission. Nothing changes until we own this. If someone would ask Jesus, Jesus, why are you here? I've been sent by my Father to serve. Look at all of Paul's letters. What's he say? Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Man, if we would be servants, what would we have to do? Just do what the master asked us. <laughs> We don't think for ourselves. What? This is a strange teaching. It's actually rather simple. How many know that you've gotten in trouble when what? You've thought for yourself. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that what we've gotten into trouble? When we've gone our own way. Not his way. Sometimes we imagine if that would be your answer too, that I'm just here by, 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 sent by my father to serve. Sometimes we get so distracted by all the noise inside and outside. We get so distracted by all the noise inside and outside that we lose, can't find, or become confused and our purpose in life becomes obscured. How many understand this concept? The furnace breaks down. This happens. We got to do this. All of a sudden, we slowly turn the ship and get off mission. Oh, this, the furnace broke. God, I'm going to pray for that guy who comes to our house. He doesn't know what's going to hit him. 
Lord, I know you have a plan for his life. Help me to minister to this furnace, the guy who fixes the furnace, or the gal who fixes the furnace. Help me to minister. Lord, I want to be. We, instead of, oh, my goodness. We can go different directions with things. We lose our way. We lose who we really are at times, don't we? Your purpose, my purpose, is already written and sealed. Your identity, my identity, is already established. When Jesus saw those early disciples, it was on the evening of Resurrection Sunday. They were locked in this room because of fear. They were afraid of the Jewish authorities. And Jesus walked right in. He showed them his hands. He showed them his side. And he says, peace be with you. And then he said, this, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And he breathed on them. That's like the breath that Almighty God did way back in Genesis to that first man. He breathed in them and he became a living soul. He breathed in them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them what they are to do. Whoever sins, you forgive, will be forgiven. And whoever sins, you don't forgive will not be forgiven. It's this message of redemption that we are to carry with us. As the Father, Jesus says, has sent me. Just as the Father sent me, I'm going to send you now. I want you to go out and be me to this world. Will you do that? Total identity change shift right there. Will you do this? Do you hear Jesus? Do you hear what he's saying? It was now the day before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. He had always loved those in the world who were his own and he loved them to the very end. Jesus and his disciples were at supper. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, the thought of betraying Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him complete power. He knew that he had come from God and was going to God. So he rose from the table, took off his outer garment and tied a towel round his waist. Then he poured some water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. He came to Simon Peter. Are you going to wash my feet, Lord? You do not understand now what I am doing, but you will understand later. Never at any time will you wash my feet. If I do not wash your feet, 
you will no longer be my disciple. Lord, do not wash only my feet, then. Wash my hands and head, too. <laughs> Those who have taken a bath are completely clean and do not need to wash themselves, except for their feet. All of you are clean. All except one. Jesus already knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, all of you except one are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet, he put his outer garment back on and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I've just done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and it is right that you should do so because that is what I am. I, your Lord and teacher, have just washed your feet. You then should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you, so that you will do just what I have done for you. I am telling you the truth. No slaves are greater than their master, and no messengers are greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know this truth, how happy you will be if you put it into practice. <laughs> I'm not talking about all of you. I know those I have chosen. But the scripture must come true that says the man who shared my food turned against me. I tell you this now before it happens. So that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. I am telling you the truth. Whoever receives anyone I send receives me also. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. I'm going to go over this passage. It's in, uh, if you have your Bibles, John chapter 13. It starts with verse 1. And I want to take note that in this passage, the one that we just saw here, which is probably 99% pure, according to the passage, Jesus, it says that Jesus knew things. Isn't that how we operate? We operate out of what we know. And I just really make, want to make a big statement about that. That's why Jesus did what he did, because he knew. And then we're going to tell you about the secret of how he knew. Because in order for us to follow God, we have to know certain things. We have to know it's God. We have to know it's right. We have to know the timing. We have to know. Because if we don't know, we slowly take our life back and go our way. Because we go back to default mode of what we thought we knew before. Because what we know now doesn't give us those things. And we think we need to know whatever we need to know now. Let's, let's look at the passage. It was just before the Passover festival. So this upper room experience happened just right before the Passover. And it's in, that's John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. It's one of the most intimate passages of Scripture where it's just Jesus and his disciples. Because Jesus knew what the occasion was. He knew he wasn't going to be on this earth that much longer. 
And when someone is on their deathbed, so to speak, he knew that he was about to go from this world to the next world. He poured it all out. He let people on, if you don't, I'm going to give a, I'm going to give a summation of everything that I really want you guys to know. <laughs> and this is what he, this is the beginning of that. Here it is. Jesus knew. There it is again. It's right up there. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Jesus knew the hour had come. And if you look through scriptures, especially in the book of John, it talks about the hour. Because he said different times. Like Mary. When Mary... It's in John chapter 2. Wanted him to do something about that there was no wine at the wedding in Cana. And Jesus says, woman, what do you have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. All of a sudden he's talking about his hour. I think Jesus knew that once the miracles start, there was a timetable that this was going to happen. And, and Jesus was kind of fiddling right there. But Mary, I think, knew it was the hour. But Jesus, <laughs> he was debating it was the hour. And then Mary said to the servants, do whatever he asks you to do. I think Jesus was in prayer. And he says, yeah, I think it is. It's time. <laughs> it's an interesting passage where there's a little conflict between him and his mother, but he, he, he acquiesces. He goes along. It's, it's the hour. And then one time, they, Jesus was doing healing. And a lot of the religious people were very upset at him. And it says they were ready to thrust him over this hill and topple him headlong. And then John says, but his hour had not yet come. And it says he walked right away through the midst of them. It's an interesting study about hour. Jesus knew the hour had come. And that's the hour of the last 24 hours of his life, which were horrendous. The hour of betrayal. Jesus knew. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's interesting. Now, some translations, about half of them says, now he loved them to the fullest extent of his love. Some translations say, which is very interesting. He poured it all out. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew. Now here's... Here's number two knowing. There's seven knowings in this passage. Jesus knew the Father had put all things under his power. What if you knew you had the disposal? Everything you need is in your hands. <coughs> now, if you really, if you, if you, you're a good biblical scholar. It talks about in Peter that God has given you everything you need for life and godliness. God has given us everything in our hands that we need to follow him too. We just don't walk by faith. We walk by... <laughs> 
We walk by something else, some other, by sight, by feeling. And he knew that he had come from God. Do you know that you'd come that you've you've come from God? See, that's that's one of the things that that it, and it goes all the way back, and it, it's taught in different schools. This theory of evolution. And what does the theory of evolution say? That you are just a mistake. Random changes. You're just a mistake. There was a big bang and this happened. Now, I had someone tell me before, and I think it's a, it's a great little illustration, that if we take all the pieces of a watch, and put them in a can. One of those empty paint cans. And then we go to, let's say we go to the hardware, Ace Hardware down here and say, I want you to shake this up. What do you think the chances are all those pieces would fly together and make a watch? <laughs> That's the Big Bang Theory. I know there's a watch because there's a watchmaker. Mm -hmm. I know there's an earth because there's a creator. And if the earth was purposed by a creator, that means you were created for a purpose too. Mm -hmm. The problem with if you actually believe that you're created for a purpose, then you're accountable. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier and a lot simpler and I can have my own way if I believe in the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> Isn't that right? For evolution. Yeah. yeah it's... And remember, they always say it's a theory. Because they don't know either because all they're doing... They're, now they're, I think it takes a lot more faith to believe in the Big Bang Theory than to believe that there's a creator. Isn't that right? I think it takes blind faith to believe in that. That Jesus had come from God and he was returning to God. Jesus knew that he was returning to God. He knew that he wasn't going to stay in the grave. He knew who he, he, knew who he was. He knew he, where he was coming from. He knew where he was going. He knew that God, the Father, had given him everything he needs. I can tell you what. He was secure in his identity. And the people that are sec the securest in their identity can lay down their power and serve. Those that are insecure don't know how to serve people well. Isn't that right? He was secure, so he, it didn't matter. He was able to lay it all out and do what is best and do the loving and then truthful thing. So he got up from the meal, took off his, his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Why, why did he say that? Why did Peter say that? Why do you think he said that? Because he thought that God is above him. Yeah, because who washes feet? Servants. The servants, the slaves, and he no 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 Lord. I have such a high view of you. I'm, I, can, I can't conceptualize of you being like that to me. I can't conceptualize of that. 
Then he says, you don't realize what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. He said, no, 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 no. You'll, you will never wash my feet. I, I'm never going to put you down to that level of a servant, of a menial servant that touches the dirty parts of me. How many of us open up the dirty parts to the purest of God, the, the purity of God. Some of us don't want to open up the, the most dirty parts and have a conversation to God about them, the dirtiest part, things in our lives. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. What's, what's Jesus saying there? What's he saying? What do you think he's saying? I may be your servant, but I still call the shots. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to represent me, you need to be clean. I don't know. I'm trying to figure out How, think about it. How can we serve? if we're dirty. Everybody needs cleaned by the Savior. Going back to the first, one of the first slides, we're harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. We need clean. We should never forget that. We have to minister out of a clean spirit, out of a clean heart. We need to come to him. And what's interesting, and then, and then Peter, then Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And then Jesus says, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. He says, I'm not talking about all of you. I'm talking about how many, how many of us go to Jesus on a daily basis? Because we get dirty in this world. We, we, got, we, got, we need to go to him often. Or else what's going to happen? I mean, we have this little thing in our house here, you know. If you've got to go to the bathroom, take your shoes off and, you know, the whole routine. And Why? Because our feet are against the dirt and the grime. And it's going to track. And we're going to rub some of that dirt in people's lives if we go out there in his name. <laughs> Isn't, that right? Isn't that right? You know, we, we need clean. We need clean. He says, those who have had a bath, those, who, those of you here who are mine, you've already let my word get in you and I've cleaned you. Your whole body's clean and you're clean. You know, you guys are clean, but... Then he says, though, not every one of you. Jesus knew what was going on. He knew there was a person among the disciples. It was not serving. That he'd been talking to the devil. Isn't that what the passage says before? Let's, let's, go, let's go to that the passage before. Yeah, keep going. Before. There it is. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. The devil's already been talking to, to Judas. He says, There's, you all are clean except one. Okay, let's, let's keep going. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that is why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand 
what I have done for you. And this is a key. This is a key to understand. Jesus says, greatest is the least. Greatest is the servant of all. You remember that? Greatest is the servant who does the dirty work. It was Fred Smith who is a Christian writer. And he says, if one of the things that you do with eaglets, eaglets are those that are going and could eventually become an eagle. The eaglets in your congregation, that what you want to do is you want to place them in an obscure place to serve where nobody, ha nobody he, they will get no praise. And if you, you give them that place where they can serve, where they get, they, it's, it, they're serving in obscurity. And if they can serve in obscurity, then you know their character. But if they can't serve in obscurity, they're not ready to become an eagle yet. <laughs> because it's sort of about them. That's why they're serving. I thought, that, I never forgot that. I said, wow, what a, what a insightful lesson. Because that goes back to our identity again. Who are we? Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked. And he, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for this is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. In other words, he's saying, you want to be like me? I want you to stoop to the lowest places and help people. I want you to reach beyond yourself. Inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. You, now I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You should also wash one another's feet. I've set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now do you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. It, it's, it, it's a significant teaching. This aspect that the leader is the servant. The leader cares. The leader listens. The leader comes alongside. The leader comes underneath. I'm not referring to all of you. I know those whom I have chosen. There's another no. But this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I... I am who I am. He's saying there's a, there's, there's a betrayer among us. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. What is he saying there? That's his very significant passage. That's seven. Whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. What's he saying? So if, as you do that, and someone doesn't accept you, someone doesn't like you, someone mistreats you, don't take it personally. <laughs> it's, don't take it personally. Isn't that right? That's right. Don't take it personally. Because 
Well, I was just trying to serve you. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Well, I was just trying to help. Yeah. Don't take it for If you are in him, then, and he is in you, when they reject you, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting him. And when they accept you, they're accepting him. They're not right. That's right. Because if you truly go in the power and the authority of Jesus is in you and you in Jesus, and this is the key, if they accept you, you can lead them to Christ right then because they're, it's, I mean, they've already accepted Jesus because they've accepted you. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. Whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. Okay, he sent you. That means he accepts Jesus. And whoever accepts Jesus accepts the Father. I mean, what? just don't take it personally. Don't get bent out of shape if people mistreat you or don't like you. Isn't that right? Don't get bent. It's not about you. Unless maybe it was about you. And then you have to check yourself. Because yes. many of us sort of have some of Jesus and some of us. And we give people these weird mixtures. Yes? Yeah? Yeah. Let's keep going. Made for mission. Who on? Why am I on mission? This is why. Jesus was on mission because it was his identity. Jesus knew who he was. He knew whose he was. Jesus knew the moment. Jesus knew where he was going. Jesus knew he had everything, all the power he needed to accomplish his mission, the foundation of the life and ministry of Jesus flowed out of his identity. Being a servant was his identity. It defined him. He knew who he was. He knew whose he was. The reason that we have fits and starts in our Christianity is because we're confused about our identity sometimes. Who am I? I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know what I'm doing. And then it's, it's, it becomes extremely difficult. Let's keep going. This is Jesus. How many want to be like Jesus? Want to be like Jesus? Let's read this passage together. This is Jesus. And this is what he says. I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders. Even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I am bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. And my judgment is right, just and righteous, because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no <laughs> desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. Whoa! Okay, so how low is Jesus? He came to serve and save. He, it ain't about him at all. You want to be like Jesus? At, what would happen if we, we'd have to check every word? We'd have to check every intention, every behavior, every decision, every thought, every action.
Unless, of course, maybe you're better than Jesus. Then. Mm -hmm. And you can go a different direction. Right? Huh? See that? Jesus is our example. If we do this, being a servant is nothing. Because this isn't the heart of being a servant, saying that it's not about what I want. It's not about my way. It's not even about your way. Just because I'm your servant doesn't mean that you're my boss. I serve God first. Right. <laughs> right? And then I serve those that he puts on my path. I mean, I, let's, let's go back. I ain't done with that one, man. Right. That, that was full. <laughs> I'm able to do nothing from myself. <laughs> Jesus. He created the world. So when he came to this earth, he gave up all his divinity buttons. <laughs> That's the way I've said it before. He, he became a man. He laid down his rights. Isn't that right? There are some occasions where it seems to peak out. Where Jesus says, I can call on 12 legions of angels. <laughs> and, and he could. He's God. He was made like us in every way so that he would become a merciful High priest. People that are just like you, that have the same struggles that you have, are merciful, aren't they? He was made like us in every way, that, we, that he would become a merciful high priest. That's what it says in Hebrews. I'm able to do nothing for myself independently of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders. So in order to be a servant, our first deal is to have God pour into us. <laughs> Isn't that it? God needs to pour into us. Pour his cleansing all over us. Pour his will, his ways his power, his presence, his purposes all over us. And then he says, even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I am bidden to decide as the voice comes to me. So I give a decision. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is, is right because I do not seek or consult my own will. Okay, so when it comes, it's not about, do I think this is right according to what I want? I don't seek my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself. <laughs> what would it look like if we would say, I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself? Woo! Man, he came to a place, didn't he? He says that Jesus humbled himself to the criminal's death. And because of that, it says, therefore, God is going to exalt him to the highest place. It was a uh, Christian book distributors. It was, it was one of their It was one of their key books this one year. And it was called Descending into Greatness. 
It was written by Bill Hybels, because that's what he said. That's what Jesus did. He descended into greatness. And he says, the problem with the book, I heard Bill Hybels talk about it. He says, the problem with the book is that nobody bought it. It's not catchy. He says, my basement is filled with this book. Anybody wants a book, I can give it to you. It's not really a catchy Christian way of, how many want to descend? Okay, we have this choice. We can stay in the garage, or we can go to a nice building that we can, let's, let's descend into greatness. Let's just stay here, right? <laughs> or you're at your job, and You can have the nice corner office that has two windows. Or you can go to the back room that has no windows. And nobody even knows how to find you. And it's tiny and it's hot. Let's choose this small, tiny, hot, obscure place, right? What... <laughs> Jesus descended into greatness. The, it's a, it, the concept is, is tremendous. Because two of his disciples were wrangling on him because mama was after Jesus and said, I want one of my sons to sit on your right and my other son to sit on your left. And it says all the disciples were all weirded out because they were trying to get their seats in the next place. And everybody wants to sit by Jesus. And then he asked them a question. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm able to drink from? If you want to do what I do and be where I am, you got to do what I do. And they said, we are. And then Jesus said, it's not up to me to decide whether you're on my right or left. <laughs> oh my goodness. They just accepted that they're able to do it. But I don't know if you get there. But, you know, it is what it is. And then Jesus took all these disciples together because they were, it says they were indignant. They were all ticked off with each other. He says, you know how leaders in the world lord it over people. He says, not so with you. Well, among you, greatest is the least. Greatest is the servant of all. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why I came. And that's who I want you to be. John understood this. John understood this. Next, next uh, slide. John here it is in John 3.27. John says, A man can receive nothing. He can claim nothing. He can take unto himself nothing except as it has been granted to him from heaven. I can't... Because they were saying, Are you the Christ? He says, I, I must... He must increase, I must decrease. A man can receive nothing, he can claim nothing, he can take nothing unto himself, nothing except has been granted to him from heaven, must be content to receive the gift which is given him from heaven. There is no other source. I am who God called me to be. And that's it. And then here's Jesus before Pilate. Pilate said to Jesus, do you refuse to speak to me? 
And Pilate says, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus says, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. The only reason you're in your position is because God gave that to you. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. And then it's interesting. From that time on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. I think Pilate realized he was standing before someone that understood in a way that blew his mind. We are, the only good that we have in us is the good that God has granted us. It's up to us if we're faithful in the small things. God will give you more. Isn't that right? There's things that we all have. One of the most precious things is time. What we do with our time is huge. So here is ministry. Jesus pours in. We pour out. We go back to Jesus. Jesus pours in. We pour out. And we go back to Jesus. That's it. <laughs> Isn't that right? Simple. It's very simple. Process. Lather, rinse, repeat. Yep. Right? <laughs> Same deal. Jesus pours in. When he pours in, he cleans up, right? Because if we start pouring out, but he hasn't poured in and cleaned us up, what are we going to pour into people? Uh, it's not good. And sometimes when we realize Jesus gave me something, we start pouring it out. We don't have the right spirit pouring it out. We don't have the right attitude pouring it out. God didn't even ask us to pour it out to that person. And we get all weird then. <laughs> this is the ministry. Jesus pours in, we, yeah, back. Jesus pours in, we pour out, we go back to Jesus. Like I said, this is simple, but comes back to who are you? Do you know who you are? Are you, are you solid on that identity thing? That's first base. If you want to start serving and doing, if you run from home to second, you're out. You got to touch first base. <laughs> Kinda go to first base. And then we can go to second base. And then we gotta go back to first base. <laughs> it just that's that's the way it is. So here's here's the passage. It's the passage, John 13, 17. Do you understand what I have told you? If you do, you will have much happiness for doing it. There's going to be satisfaction in your life if you serve in his name through his power. This will be a, satisfac this will be a satisfied life in Jesus. interesting, happy. He wants to be happy. You know. That's the word that's used. Blessed. I guess that's a, I guess that's a little more spiritual. Isn't it? You'll have a blessed life. 
a life of favor poured out on you. Jesus pours in. Jesus cleans up. Jesus pours out. We go back to Jesus. This is life. The mission we sometimes think when we're serving God is impossible, but it's not. With God, when we walk with God, it's possible. Because, but when we do it in our own strength, it becomes impossible. He's granted us the strength to do it, but it's only following Him, letting Him do the leading and guiding. Uh, I just uh, saw a video here. This lady we talk about the wrong mission. This lady was on. She, uh, it was on a plane. There was a guy sitting in the window seat. Guy, the woman sitting in the middle and her husband sitting on the end. He had a political shirt on, nothing bad, just a picture of the person in the name. She went off on him. I mean, she just ran it and raves. He, ta- he videoed it and somebody else on the other side videoed it. And it was, uh, she was adamant she was not going to leave the plane. Be- and she, it was his fault. He, because of what he wore, it was his fault. She wanted him to be moved. Yeah, and so they, the marshal came, said, you have to leave. No, I'm not. Her, her, the, her husband's mother passed away, never going wherever to the funeral. And, and he said, sorry, the captain said you can't. You know, it's off the plane. She was still adamant. She, I mean, numerous times she said she wasn't. Finally, the police came and escorted her off the plane, and they clapped as she went off. But can you imagine that, that, how that type of mission, what statement that says to, to him? I mean, you know, her... It was about her. It wasn't about the, uh, respecting the other person. Yeah, his views may have been different. And yet he sat there quiet the whole time. He never said nothing. Oh, wow. he, he, never he, he never made a peep, yes. He was very respectful and just held his phone taping her. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's, that's, Woo. yeah. And I think of one mission, a person in my life that was a mission for me, and that was Tom. You know, it would be four years coming up here in September, he's been gone. And I remember for the longest time I felt that he was a burden to a point, you know, and, you know, and it, it took for maybe the last, we knew each other for 25 years, I'd say about, at least. I'd say about the last 10 maybe, or so, at least 10, a, God finally spoke to me and said, you know, that he's in my life because he's a mission for me and help me grow. And it was, yeah, and I was, I felt blessed after that. And it, and it was, Tom was so simple and it w- wasn't hard. It wasn't hard to, to do for him. He was so pleasing, so simple. And yet I took it the wrong way. And I, I'm grateful for that mission now because it showed me that somebody in his position, he, he didn't speak a lot. I mean, he said, said simple things, but yet his life spoke predominantly for me. And I, I'm grateful for that. You know, it was a great mission. You know, and when you said some, in our situations, we sometimes have some of Jesus in us and some of us, you know, it's some of us in, in us instead of Jesus. First thing I thought of was a filing cabinet. We got a filing cabinet in front of us, and when a situation happens, we open the drawer and we look up that situation, and it tells us how to respond. And we shouldn't be doing that. I mean, the, it should be Jesus should be, you know, the answer in every folder for every situation. <laughs> oh. The Jesus folder. Jesus cabinet and Jesus. What do I do with this one? Oh, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah. What do exactly. I do here? Oh, it's Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. It's simple. Yeah. We, I like that. Yeah. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be a checklist of all these things. Um, our, an identity for me, one, one area I struggled with identity was being a people pleaser. And I've realized that that wasn't Jesus. I mean, he wasn't a people pleaser. I mean, he did make people unhappy. He tested people and pushed them to their limits. You know, the Pharisees, the people that were against him, but he still stood his ground. He knew who he was in God, regardless of the situation and the people around him. You know, and a lot of times it can come back to, for us and myself, you know, the influences, the people in our lives. Who, who influenced you? How did they influence you? What did you take away from that to be that influencer? I mean, or was it Jesus? You know, a lot of times people put into us who they are, but they don't try to bring out who really we are, who 
Christ is in us, what he's gifted us with in the, the talents and abilities. And I think, too, the same with the military. There are a lot of great people served. A lot of people have adjusted coming out of the military, but there's a lot that haven't. And then they, they themselves, when you said, you said give orders, I thought of the same. The military gives the orders. And when they come out, they're, they're still used to that, you know, the order mode. And then they have that, that's their default. And they struggle adapting back to civilian life. And it, it's sad. And then, but yet they get, there's the therapy, the help out there for these military people. I'm grateful for people who have gone and served. And, but yet I hope and pray that they will get their uh, civilian life back, you know, the way God intended it to be. You know, he didn't intend for them to live in a war zone, even in their own life, personal life, outside of, outside of having a uh, life centered in Christ. So, uh, announcements will be meeting at the church in Smithville on Main Street. Uh, so come and join us at Tuesday night at 6. Any other announcements? Okay, we'll take up the offering and bless God with our tithes. Up here. Thank you. Lord, thank you for your many blessings this week, this past week, Lord. And I just pray for the upcoming blessings, Lord. As we leave, we're going to be entering a new mission field, Lord. And as the people cross our paths, Lord, I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be in touch with them. And Lord, speak to us, Lord, that we can bring them closer to you, Lord. And may you be the influencer of our lives, Lord. And as we go out, Lord, just grant us safety, grant us peace, Lord. And I pray that we'll rely more upon you, Lord. And as we open that filing cabinet drawer, Lord, pray that uh, it's Jesus in every folder is every solution to everything that we cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Go and have a great week. God bless.